Haji Yahya Khalil Staku. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The Honorable General Chairman of Nahdlatul Ulama, His Excellency Kiai Haji Yahya Khalil Staku, Rector of the Indonesian International Islamic University, Professor Komarudin Hidayat, the board members of Triple IU, and all distinguished guests. Welcome to the Triple IU Public Lecture. R20 Bali Communique and Challenges of Religions Ahead. I'm Fahrul Hafiz Rinaldi, and on behalf of the Triple IU Organizing Committee, I would like to extend our highest appreciation for your attendance and participation. Please rise for the national anthem of Indonesia, Lagu Indonesia Raya, followed by the university's hymn, Hymna Universitas Islam Internasional Indonesia.
gentlemen, please remain standing. It has come to our attention that Nahdlatul Ulama is about to become a religious organization that has stood for 100 years. In the midst of the celebration of the anniversary, His Excellency Gus Yahya is still able to be present here with us to deliver his public lecture, and we extend our utmost commendation. To commence this event, and in respect to all the contribution that Nahdlatul Ulama has given to Indonesia and the world, we will now turn our attention to the first century anthem of Nahdlatul Ulama, Marawat Jagat Membangun Peradaban. Thank you. Please return to your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to invite Professor Komarudin Hidayat to deliver his welcoming remarks. Professor, the stage is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa syukurillah wa salatu wassalamu ala sayyidina Rasulullah amma ba'du. Honorable General Chairman of Ahdul Ulama, Gus Yahya, my colleague and friend, lecturer and teachers. I think and I'm sure that today we are very lucky to have Gus uh, Yahya, the Chairman of Ahdul Ulama to share his uh, rates, experiences, and wisdom about Islam in Indonesia. Why? Because actually between our university and Nahdul Lama has uh, shared mission and wisdom that is to introduce, to nurture Islam wasatiyah in Indonesia, moderate Islam. And every student every uh, faculty and all of faculty, they are obliged to attend the lecture about Islam Wasatiyah. Islam Wasatiyah is rich content because it should be approached from many different angles. And today we have a great lecture about Islam Indonesia. It is part of the issue of Islam Wasatiyah in Indonesia. Well, I can say a lot of things and wisdom about Nahdal Ulama, but it is not my time to say about that. My job is only to 
we are welcoming our guest lecturer. And uh, as far as I know that uh, Nahdul Lama is among other uh, Islamic organizations that is very much aware about the function of cultural power in developing, introducing, formulating Islam in Indonesia. Uh, well, actually, we are all the children uh, of culture. And we are living in the culture. Even religion cannot grow without culture. Culture and religion uh, influence each other. And then we are nurtured and raised by the culture. And within this culture, there is Islamic revolution. So what we call Islamic tradition, Islamic thought, actually it is the the melting, the integration between revelation and the power of reasoning. So in Indonesia, uh, well known as the largest Muslim country, it is the the place where between revelation, tradition, and reason growing together in such a way that makes Indonesia very colorful of the expression of Islam. We are uh, very much aware that Islam as uh, revelation of, is only one, that is uh, Al-Wahyu from Allah through Muhammad. But myself accept Islam not from Malaikat Jibril, but I accept Islam from my father, my surrounding, my culture. Therefore, Islam, which I understood, is Islam through cultural construction. And whenever Islam grows in a story, then it uh, brings about the cultural horizon. Therefore, what we call Islamic civilization, it is historical istihad. It is historical production. Therefore, there are large room to explore, to rethink, to istihad. And that's why we need to use uh, critical thinking, empirical approach, as well as spiritual approach when we study Islam. And this university tries to integrate, to combine this approach. We start from, well, we are uh, believer. All of us believe in, in God. But at the same time, we use critical thinking. Why? Because what we learn about religion, any religion actually, it is historical construction. And Islam also as a historical and social facts, therefore we emphasize, we approach Islam through empirical, sociological, and, and political approach. That's why when you receive course on uh, Islam wasatiyah, you will find this kind of approach. We use interdisciplinary approach, we apply or we use also uh, multidiscipline. Even now there is a new term that is transdiscipline. And uh, today, well, as a rector, I would like to appreciate your visit here to give lecture, Gus Yahya. And we congratulate for the 100 Nahdlatul Ulama in Indonesia. 100 years, 100 years. It's, 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 well, give applause. You can imagine 100 years already uh, Nahdlatul Ulama established in Indonesia. And Indonesia is a state, it is actually the son of social movement. One of them as a mother of republic, that is Muhammadiyah and Nahdlatul Ulama. Those both uh, Islamic organization, it is the largest Muslim organization in the world. The member of followers, followership of uh, Nahdul Lama is range about between maybe how many million? Because the follower of Nahdul Lama, hundred forty, yeah, yeah, hundred forty. There is no formal census, yeah, but at least emotionally, you can claim that there is hundred, hundred forty. What about Muhammadiyah then? Yeah. You know, whenever I meet a foreigner, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, foreigner, researcher, and journalist uh, ask to me, are you an O of Muhammadiyah? Always asking like that. What do you mean? Yes, 
Because as far as I know that in Indonesia only Muslim either NU or Muhammadiyah. So uh, the rest is not considered. Gitu. Then I say, I am Muhammad Dinu. Gitu. I say <laughs> they get confused. Why? Then I explain that it is organization. Gitu. Uh, and this, uh, the big historical political capital for Indonesia, Muhammadiyah and Natul Ulama, then those two uh, organization that as a uh, the guardian of Pancasila, the guardian of civil society, and the guardian how to implement the vision and mission of the independence of Indonesia. Well, uh, I don't need to uh, give further speech. I would like to enjoy soon. The, the lecture will be delivered by our respectable guest, Kusahya. Terima kasih. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Thank you, Professor Komarudin. We can now begin the public lecture session. Please welcome the General Chairman of Nahdlatul Ulama, His Excellency, Kiai Haji Yahya Khalil Staku, on stage to start his lecture. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, syukurlah, salatu salam ala Rasulullah. Sayyidina Maulana Muhammad ibn Abdullah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa wala. Amma ba'd. Honorable Rector of um, International Indonesian Islamic University. Did I mention it right? Wrong? What's the right? Indonesian International Islamic University. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm still kind of uh, confused about. Uh, so I usually just simplify the mentioning by saying that this is a university with a lot of eyes. Yes, we have a university with one eye, and then later on we have, you know, they established a university with two eyes. Now we have university with a lot of eyes. Honorable Rector, His Excellency Professor Dr. Kamaruddin Nidayat, distinguished lecturers and students, researchers, ladies and gentlemen, so I, I'm supposed to speak in English, right? Okay. Yeah, I remember when I was about to do the the uh, Agdun Nikah. My master, which is which which is also my uncle, he asked me what 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 uh, what language I would want the Agdun Nikah to be conducted. Uh, do I want to have it in, in in Japanese or Arabic or or other language? Well, that's it, you know, because I'm I am a, a kus, meaning son of a kiai. Yeah. <laughs> I said okay in Arabic. You know, yeah. So now I. Uh, I have to ask, you know, what's the language I should use for this uh, speech. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I am given a topic related to the uh, R20 that we conducted in the early November of last year in Bali and Yogyakarta. Uh, I would like to first explain why we did the R20. Before this, uh, before the G20 forum this year in Indonesia, um, 
it was in um, several years in G20 forums. Uh, they uh, had this uh, interface forum, which they call the Interface 20 or IF20. But now this year, we didn't do IF20, but we did R20. And I was asked why, why we uh, did not do the IF20, and instead we did R20. I said this because because we we have a different idea about how an interface dialogue should be conducted. The IF20 usually put as topics of of the uh, forum um, issues related to economy and environment you know, and virus thing uh, that uh, reflect uh, the policies of government and ask uh, the people who, who are supposed to be representatives of religion to offer supports from the perspective of religions for those policies. How religion, for example, how religion, you know, can formulate a religious, you know, articulation to support policies on environment, for example, policies on uh, economy, policies on, for example, gender issues. Right? and so forth. Now, we chose another approach. We understand that this kind of uh, approach in bringing forward the role of religions into uh, public issues is something quite uh, familiar everywhere, at least since uh, 1980s. I remember in Indonesia back then, in 1980s, Nandatul Lama was encouraged to produce a uh, religious formulation as a port. As, as, as support to uh, the family planning program it belongs to the government, belong to the government at the time. You know. So religion, you know, and, and, and in one sense, is used, utilized to mobilize support from the people of religion for a particular policy uh, of the government. Now, this is not a bad thing. Yeah. Obviously, family planning is a good thing. You know, uh, the concern uh, to the uh, problems of the environmental problem is a good thing. Yeah. But, and so forth, yeah. But, the thing is that we still have problems that uh, come from within religion. It is a fact that a very significant portion in conflicts that are happening in different places in the world actually related to religion. This uh, disaster in Middle East is related to religion. 
this um, chaotic conflict between Muslims and the Christian people in West Africa, obviously related to religion. What we are seeing in India nowadays related to religion. So religion actually has everything to do in various hotspots in different places in the world. And it might also have a um, significant role in um, prolonging the tensions that occurs in various uh, societies, including in the West, um, that in, involving, involving the uh, different uh, groups of uh, ethnics and religion. What the European, some European people call as uh, the crisis of immigration, actually, in a sense, also related to religion. Why it is a, a crisis related to uh, immigration in Europe? Because, you know, a lot of immigrants coming into Europe are actually Muslims coming into a non-Muslim society in Europe. So, it's been a very complex matter, actually, but religion has a portion you know, of role in there. As you can see, you know, recently, what happened with this, uh, this Swedish, you know, this is Swedish uh, a politician, you know, uh, Rasmus Paludan. You know, the problem that he is articulate, articulating is not just religion, but surely related to religion. So we have, in fact, a problem of relationship between different groups of religions. The relationship between Muslims and Christians you know, are not well, actually. It's problematic until now. The relationship between Muslims and Hindus, problematic, and also with the, with the Buddhists. You know, relationship between different uh, streams of Christianity and even in Europe, it's still problematic up until now. Relationship between different streams of Islam in Muslim societies is still also problematic until now. So we've been doing this tradition of internet interface dialogue since when? For decades. I remember I was already uh, an activist in this uh, you know, arena since like 1980s. And what's the result that we have? In 2017, um, Vice President of the United States, Mike Pence, visited Indonesia. And we, uh, you know, we uh, held for him a, a, an interface forum in Istiqlal back then. I think maybe Professor Komarudin also attended that, uh, that forum. And I attended uh, as representative of Nadatul Ulama. When I was uh, given uh, the uh, opportunity to speak, I said, I just tossed a question. How long have we been doing this? This interface, this supposed to be interface dialogue. Because what happened back then was like uh, a usual traditional interface dialogue where every you know, the representatives of each religion 
we're talking about uh, how uh, the religion that they represent is a peaceful religion, religion, peace, uh, love, and so forth, you know, like what we usually have in an in interfaith a forum like that, you know, nice words. So I said, you know, I said, I asked question, how long have you been doing this? And what's the result? You know, are things getting, getting better? I said, the fact, it's not. Things are getting worse. And this only have one meaning. We are doing it the wrong way. We have to find another way. In doing it, which I believe, you know, this other way that we have to pursue, I believe, has to be truly based on honesty. We have to speak honestly about the problem, even if the problem actually comes from our own religion. We have to honestly admit that, acknowledge that. Because if we want to resolve a problem, first thing, we have to simply recognize the problem. A problem that is not recognized cannot be resolved. So, if we want a religion to take part, to have a uh, constructive role in bringing forward various humanitarian concerns, such as environmental concern, economic concerns, you know, uh, concerns of social justice and so forth, you know. Religion should first have credibility that it truly means something for the society. And to have that credibility, religion should be able to resolve its own problem. Now we have probability to religion and up until now religion still fail to address that problem. Proven by what's happened in various places in the world where religion actually, you know, um, present as source of the problem. The problem what we have in Middle East now, in Iraq, Iran, in Syria, in uh, Libya, is the problem democracy? No. Religion is the problem. And it happens in various places in the world. This crisis in the West, you know, both in Europe and United States, that uh, uh, bring about uh, more and more political polarization. It has religion as uh, one of the elements, you know, in their problem. So we have to talk about it. That's what we are, you know, we were trying to do with this R20, and we did it. The thing is, so, in our discussion, we found out that actually conflict and enmity has been the default mode of religion. Because religion claim to present the absolute truth against what is claimed to be false or wrong, then religion go against those other, you know, uh, faith. And you can see in history, it's simply what's, hap what's been happening in history, how religion fight one another over claims of truth. And it's been the default mode of religion. So that's why, you know, with all due respect 
Profesor Komarudin. You know. The discourse about moderate Islam, I would say, is not an, an effective discourse. It's not an honest discourse. <laughs> Because, see, it defies the conversation about the call for conflicts based on Islamic teachings, which is there. I've been taught since my childhood with that kind of teachings. So we have to deal with that. So that's what we did in the R20. We opened an honest conversation about these problems. And then we realized that we have the same thing from, you know, every religion. We have problems in Christianity, in Judaism, in Hinduism, and so forth. So we talked about that. So the idea is to find how religion should function and in the context of our current reality, the reality of 21st century civilization. And it has to be different. Now, in In doing that, you know, we have to uh, find a valid strategy. First, we have to be honestly recognized and identify the true problems of religion. You know, It's also growing as a, uh, a view in many secular, secu uh, secular uh, societies, you know, that religion should be rejected and avoided because, because it, it brings problems. So religion should reclaim recover its uh, again its its uh, credibility by resolving these problems now we have to honestly identify and acknowledge what is the problem with religion and the first that we should recognize is that every religion actually has tradition with problematic tenets of teachings. Yeah. Let me talk about Islam, for example. I've been taught with this kind of teaching since my, since my childhood until, yeah. until now. That the others, the non-Muslims, the infidels, are our enemy and enemy of God. So the basic view of Islam, see, that's been taught to our children up until now about non-Muslims is that they are enemies, is enmity. So what do we do with that? We have to acknowledge this. It is based on that kind of view that now, for example, the so-called radicals and extremists develop this ideology of al-wala wal-bara, who are our allies and who are our enemies. What is the boundary of, you know, alliance and enmity? This is a problem. Now, then what we need to do surely is we have to develop an alternative discourse on this. Because this kind of, this, this tenets, this problematic tenets of teachings 
are still considered authoritative up until now. So, and we in Indonesia, we are experiencing this. We keep experiencing this up till now. What happened in 2012, 2014, 2017 is this. This problematic tenets that then are rearticulated to serve political purposes. And so we need to create, to generate alternative discourse for that. And then, so that means some ideas, some tenets, some teachings may have to be relinquished or in the Nandatul Amak language should be recontextualized with the context of current reality. Now, this, this are what we did in the R20 forum. We have discussion, we had discussion in that forum in Bali and Yogyakarta uh, um, which uh, contain criticism, criticisms you know, and you know um, self-criticism from each religion about what's problematic and the teaching of each religion. We have, for example, criticism from the Christians, uh, Christian leaders, about what's problematic in, Christ, uh, in the teaching of Christianity, you know, as well as uh, I and other Muslim leaders were talking about also problematic uh, issues in Islamic teaching. And also the the Jewish uh, leaders and the Hindu leaders back then. And actually, uh, uh, we did ha uh, our, our uh, expectation actually uh, met what happened in Bali and Yogyakarta in our R24. Before that, we are seeing that people were afraid that criticism uh, can, you know, can trigger uh, uh, conflicts between groups of religion. But the thing is, we need to do it, although it is, you know, never comfortable for us. But we need to do it because, you know, precisely it is the problem. And people who were involved in R20 forum, they were you know, amazingly so excited with this discussion. They're so excited and so enthusiastic to a point that they say, they said themselves that this should not be just one of event. We have to do this R20, we have to develop this R20 forum as a global movement because this is what we need, which is again an honest discussion about the problem related to religion, the problem coming from religion. See, this is uh, actually a long shot because we still have politicians who, for the interest of gaining support, usually use religion as weapon, as political weapon. It happens 
in Indonesia, it happens, it is happening now in India, in Nigeria, in Myanmar, and other places in the world. So, we need more decisive component of strategy to deal with this problem. Once we have the uh, alternative discourse on the issues of relationship between different religions, we need to go forward with a reform and in our religious educational system. We need to think about what should be changed in our educational, you know, religious educational systems, such as madrasa and pesantren, for example. The curriculum, the, you know, the method, the pedagogy, you know, and so forth. We need to think about that. And also, then we need to develop a, uh, because this has to do with the mindset of the people, we are in need for a social movement to bring forward this change. So actually, various uh, actors, significant actors, already did the efforts in this direction. For example, the Catholic Church did in 1965, actually, what they call the Second uh, Vatican. And in that forum, you know, when uh, where they uh, ha had the gatherings of uh, uh, Catholic leaders, they uh, came to a new position of, you know, of Catholicism by saying that there is salvation beyond the Catholic Church. That's what they did at the Second Vatican. In 2016, there is a group of uh, rabbis who did a uh, rabbinical uh, conference somewhere in the United States. And as the result of that uh, uh, forum, they produce what they call the Tetsufa document, you know, the document of repentance. In that document, they actually honestly, honestly addressed problematic elements within the teachings of Judaism, such as this view related to non non Jewish people. You know, the uh, you know the status of non-Jewish people, which in traditional Judaism uh, is viewed as something like subhuman to them, comparing to Jewish people, because Jewish people are chosen ones and the non-Jewish people are just unchosen, <laughs> meaning, you know, what they call the Gentile something lower, of lower dignity you know, compared to Jewish people. This is acknowledged by these rabbis as part of their traditional teachings. And they call for relinquishing this view. And this is good. And we invite, invited one of uh, uh, the leaders of this movement they, they call it the 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 uh, Masorti, you know, movement. The Masorti movement. We uh, one of their leader. Their leader is uh, actually Rabbi Alan Brill. Yeah. 
from the United States. We invited them. He came and he, he, he spoke about this in R20. And also in 2019, actually, now that Ulama held a uh, national con convention of ulamas in Kota Banjar of West Java back then. We had thousands of uh, NU ulamas. You know. <clears throat> when I say thousand means thousands, you know, maybe not less than 20,000 ulamas, you know, came in that gathering in Kota Banjar. See, Nandut Lama actually, we don't have registered membership. We don't do, you know, <clears throat> we don't register our members. So we don't have this, you know, record of how many members actually we have. What we have is people who self-identify, you know, who identify themselves as follower of Nadatul Lama. So it comes from <clears throat> some uh, survey, actually. I got this from, for example, Burhanuddin Muhtati. You know, I don't know what, what survey that he's in. Huh? Indicator. He said that uh, according to their survey, uh, we have like 50.3% uh, of Indonesian population claiming as followers of Nadatul Ulama. That means 50.3% of uh, uh, 275 million people of Indonesia. So, okay. So I ask another reliable source, which is an answer you know, leader and also uh, secretary of our uh, research uh, uh, body with Safik Hashim is in that uh, institute also, you know. We have a friend, this friend named Hasanuddin Ali. He has his own research institute called Alfara. And I asked him how many? And he said, we have 59.2% of Muslim populations of Indonesia claiming to be followers of Nadatul Ulama. So that means 59.2% out of 238 million people, you know. That's why I said 140 million. So, um, I, um, I'd rather not mention, you know, the percentage of Muhammadiyah, you know. You know, because uh, yeah, I'm not to be seen as offending. So we have this national conference, uh, 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 you know, convention of ulamas in 2019, and these ulamas are out of discussion. So we 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 put some questions, you know, some key questions to them to answer first. A question about what is the status of infidel or non-Muslim? Is non-Muslim should be viewed as enemy that has to be destroyed, that is eligible to kill? Because there is this uh, view, this very authoritative view in Islamic discourse that in Islamic discourse that said that al asl fil kafir. Halaluddam wal mal illa liman lahul aman min al imam. The original status of non Muslim, of infidel, is eligible to kill and to be, you know, confiscated for his belongings. Except those who get this uh, um, guarantee from the leader, from the imam. It is there. And it's still considered to be very authoritative view in fiqh, in, uh, you know, in sharia. So now, what is the status now? The status of non-Muslim. The second, second question is, what is the status of a caliphate? 
of uh, uh, establishing a caliphate. What is the legal status, the legal status of establishing caliphate in the eye of Sharia? And the third is, you know, what is the obligation for Muslims when they encounter a different you know, different um, laws between national law and the Sharia law. Which law should Muslim abide by? A national law or Sharia law? And the fourth question is, uh, what is the obligation for Muslim when they encounter conflicts between Muslims and non-Muslims. Because the original teaching is wherever there is a conflict between a group of Muslim against a group, a group of non-Muslim, you know, any Muslim should join the, the fight, you know, to help fellow Muslims. In the name of helping fellow Muslims. And there are, you know, this hadith on that. Al Muslimul Mu'mul Muslim, Al Mu'minul Mu'min, Kal Jajadil Wahid. One believer and another is like one body. When one hurt, then the other, you know, should feel hurt and should help. So now, what what would be the, the obligation? Because if we keep this view, then we have go, we have to go, you know, in a war against Philippines, against Myanmar, against Thailand, against India, against whatever. Because there are conflicts between group of Muslim against group of non-Muslims, you know, in those. Uh, areas based on religion. What is the conflict between this uh, southern Philippine with the uh, uh, Filipino government? It's religion. What the problem between the uh, Patani and the Thailand government? Religion. India religion everywhere. It is a religious conflict. Whatever people say, in reality, in fact, it is a religious conflict. So what would be the obligation of Muslim in this case? So these ulamas in that convention, they came to, uh, you know, a theological positioning, or you can say fatwas. You know, They issued fatwas related to answer this question. First they said, the status and category of uh, non-Muslim or infidel on, or kafir is no longer relevant in the context of modern nation state. Because no state has a legitimate claim to represent Islam as a whole. So that's why it's relevant anymore to see non-Muslim you know, as, you know, a different, uh, different group in society with different, you know, legal uh, status and position. Meaning, you know, when, when they say that uh, the status of non-Muslim is no longer relevant in modern nation state, there is no legitimate discrimination based on uh, difference of uh, religion. Because everybody has to be equal before the law. So everybody has the same right and dignity in society, same right to, um, you know, elect, and same right to be elected. Because it's not relevant anymore. 
the status and the category of non-Muslim is no longer relevant in the context of modern nation state. That's the answer for the first question. For the second question, this ulama said that the obligation of uh, Muslims is to abide by the national laws. And it is forbidden to use Sharia, whatever uh, it is, uh, they want to bring about, the idea that they want to bring about, it is forbidden to use Sharia as a reason to defy the national law, let alone to go against a legitimate government. And if it is seen that some issues that there is there are some issues in 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 national law that are problematic in the eye of sharia you know people should uh, try or do the, the effort to change it through a constitutional uh, way because the most important thing in a society is stability and social order. Because without, in a society where there is no social order, nobody is protected. Everybody is subject to uh, threats. So, the obligation is to abide by national law. And it is forbidden to use Sharia to as as a reason to defy or go against national law. The answer for the third question is that establishing caliphate is not a religious or Sharia obligation. People are free to create any construct any construct of state, you know, any um social political construct for their society as they wish they can establish a republic like what we do in indonesia they can establish a kingdom or whatever they want but people are free because caliphate is not a um you know it's not like an officially Sharia construct of social politics. No. So it is not a religious obligation to establish a caliphate. Now for the fourth question, the answer is that Muslims are obliged to struggle and fight for peace and not getting involved in any conflict uh, in the name of helping fellow Muslims because involving in the conflict means you know um, means um, uh, making the fitna making the fitna bigger it's enhancing the fitna so the obligation is to resolve the problem to end the fitna by uh, making efforts for peace. And these are examples of how we can recontextualize you know, problematic tenets in our uh, religious teachings. And now I know we have uh, a uh, a community of evangelical Christians who are working on this kind of efforts too. Because I know this because actually since 2018, we have an official working group with the World Evangelical Alliance. So it's, it's a ongoing works. To have a recontextualized 
evangelical teachings. If you see what I mean. So this is something we need. Now, further study that we did, that we are doing, uh, brings us to a uh, thought that we need a strong foundation which can be um, used as the foundation to develop a new uh, set of teachings related to the relationship between different religious groups. Now, we come to a conclusion, actually, that this conflicts between different groups of religion and different groups of identity, actually, has been the mode of civilizational uh, you know, relationships. All these centuries and thousands of years of human civilization. If you look at what happened in the era of ancient Rome, in the era of Egypt, in the era of um, Assyria, you know, Assyria and Sumeria, and also this uh, Inca and Maya in Latin America, it's all about conflicts between different identities and different religions, different ethnics, different races, uh, which uh, bear in them ideas of religion. So when the Rome go for a war against the Persia, it's not just about race or ethnics, it's also about, it was also about religion. So, and the world went to a point that this conflicts of identities then um, erupted in a two great world war, which is the World War One, World War Two with unprecedented casualties. World War I, we had more than 20 million casualties, combatants and non-combatants. And then even, in, uh, we even uh, more, uh, there are even more casualties in World War II. We had uh, between 70 to 85 million casualties in World War II. This was shocking to the world, obviously. And this then um, um, drew the world toward a consensus about developing a new kind of international order. That's how uh, these international actors then came to a consensus on what we call the United Nations Charter. It's because of the awareness, you know, about the need for a new international order which can guarantee more stability and uh, uh, security you know, globally. That's the United Nations Charter followed by the activ uh, activation of United Nations Organization. United Nations Charter, 26 of June, 1945. Uh, and the activation of UN Organization is in uh, October of the same year, 1945. So, that's why, so we are seeing this, this international consensus. Yeah can be a starting point 
we think that if Islam, you know, represented by the ulamas, can find an you know, a legal status of this international consensus in the eye of Sharia, then we can develop all this, uh, uh, you know, required uh, views, religious views to uh, nurture more uh, 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 peaceful relationship between different religions. So, yeah, because it is, whatever we talk about this tolerance, you know, peace, you know, harmony, whatever, it's based on this international consensus of the UN Charter. See, we didn't do tolerance back then in 1940, right? We, we even didn't do tolerance when in September or yeah, September 1945, these allies, uh, the, the ally, uh, the ally, uh, the, the troops of the allies came to Surabaya. We didn't tolerate them. <laughs> we went for war against them, sacrificed so many. We didn't do, we, we didn't do tolerance back then. So, did the Ottoman Turk, you know, practice tolerance against these Christian uh, European uh, kingdoms? No. Did the Catholic kingdom in Europe, did, you know, conducted tolerance, you know, toward the uh, Protestant or the Anglican? kingdom. No. Tolerance was not needed back then before this UN Charter. Tolerance, we we call for tolerance because we want a more peaceful world, right? And it started with this UN Charter. So now we think we can use this as a starting point. That's why in uh, 6 February, you know, uh, it's one day before the uh, the <clears throat> big uh, uh, ceremony for the, uh, you know, centenary um, centenary um uh, ceremony of Nahdlatul Ulama, you know. So we we are going to do the uh, the official uh, ceremony to commemorate the a century of uh, the establishment of Nahdlatul Ulama in the seventh of February. Uh, it matched. Uh, it, it matches the um, 16th of Rajab of 1444. Because Nada Tulama was established in 16 Rajab of 1344, and it's going to be in the 7th of February uh, next month. You know, it's going to be in uh, Situarjo. One day before that, on the 6th of February, we will conduct. A, uh, another conference, the National Conference of Ulamas in Surabaya, and the topic is going to be about the legal status of United Nations uh, a charter in the eye of Sharia. If it is considered to be a justified and legitimate um, agreement, then it should bind Muslims everywhere. There we can develop, you know, a uh, more comprehensive, constructive uh, discourse in Sharia related to the 
relationship between different religions. So, and this is, we are doing this as the continuation of the R24 also. So this is the, you know, a part of, of this, uh, what we call the, uh, the global movement of the R20. And we, we have also already plans in other places, such as in May, inshallah, we'll do a conference in Erbil, Iraq, on the topics of um, uh, defending the rights of religious minorities everywhere in the world. We also have a plan already in December in Princeton University of another forum related to uh, human rights and so forth. You know. So this is going to be a global movement. We are already in a uh, ongoing uh, discussion with the with our Indians uh, counterparts uh, in developing the. Um, discourse, the, the agenda for our next R20 forum in India, inshallah, you know, under the, the, the leadership of India in G20 forum. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is, uh, uh, you know, most, you know, the most part of the idea that we are developing related to uh, this uh, the issue of uh, relationship between different religions and as a basic idea in this is that we should not stop only with this discourse of Islam wasatiyah or, or moderate Islam because it is not enough. We have to go forward with honestly addressing the problematic uh, elements and the teachings of Islam itself, and also the teachings of each other religions. Thank you. Allahul Mafiq, Laq Bintariq, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullahi Wabarakatuh. Thank you, Gus Yahya, for your wonderful and excellent lecture. We'll now enter the discussion session. So, we invite students, lecturers, or staff members of Triple IU to ask their questions. Now to Gus Yahya, please raise your hand to ask your question. And if you are selected, uh, please come up to the front of the stage because we want our online participants to look at you as well. Uh, to uh, His Excellency Gus Yahya, could you select three questions for us to decide? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so to me. So I suppose the first one should go to the Dean of the Faculty of Education, Professor Nina Nurmila. Please come up front. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Let me introduce myself first. I am Nina Nurmila. I am the Dean of the Faculty of Education. Thank you very much for your coming to our campus. We are very grateful for this. And I would like to highlight one of your important uh, points about your concern about the misuse of religion for political purpose. So my question is, what strategy What strategy that NU, N, NU uh, Nahdlatul Ulama has used uh, to prevent the misuse of a religion for political purpose. I ask you this question because you are the top leader of Nahdlatul Ulama and I know that NU has many educational institutions throughout Indonesia. And by the way, I like your name, K. Haji Yahya Khalil Stakuf. The way, I mean, I also do like your brother's name, the Ministry of Religious Affairs, yeah, Yakut Khalil Kaumas. I think the names are very distinctive and beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Nurmila. So the next question, please raise your hands. Uh, okay, uh, Nasir, you can come in front. Uh, 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, thank you for your wonderful lectures. Uh, my question is like, okay, sorry. <laughs> my name is Muhammad Muhammad Nasir, uh, MA student in the Faculty of Islamic Studies, and I am from Nigeria. Okay, I'm um, looking back to the early days of Islam and and how Islamic system operated. I believe there existed a constitution, the Sturul Medina, which promotes peace and tolerance. And I believe that constitution accommodated everyone in spite of his religious affiliation. So, I mean, your emphasis on rebranding re re Islam, which is to me like more of changing the religion itself, don't you think that it's more of going back and reflecting on how the Islamic system operated in the early years and implementing the same teachings, which I believe they were effective in accommodating both the Christians, the Jews, and even the infidels, rather than changing Islam, which I believe it's not even unanimously agreed by these scholars worldwide. Terry Makasi. Thank you, Mama Nasir. So one more question. Uh, I suppose to you mean yeah one more. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, I'm Melanie Buiten Zorgi from uh, I'm a lecturer from IPB uh, Gus Yahya. So I'm coming a long way from Bogor just to listen to uh, Gus Yahya lecture, which is uh, which is uh, very enlightened for me because it is sesuatu banget. Uh, <laughs> uh, the leader of P uh, PBNU likes to talk about this quite a uh, sensitive issue, uh, uncomfortable issue to to talk. Uh, Gus Yahya, uh, uh, may I point the um, data from um, Mas Burhanuddin Muhtadi's uh, Lembaga Survey uh, that uh, the follower of uh, Nadatul Ulama in Indonesia is uh, more than 50%. But unfortunately, uh, that, is not, um, that is not the case for higher education world in Indonesia. Um, maybe uh, also um, in my university, um, because we know that in higher education sector, in Indonesia is still dominated by the conservative way, uh, the conservative um, views conservative um, organization that we know which one but we don't we don't need to uh, to uh, mention um, my question is uh, Gusiaya, do you have any um, suggestion uh, what is the practical way for us like me a lecturer in uh, from the internal how to um, balance this uh, conservative domination Islamic conservative domination uh, in the higher education, the campus, campus in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Gus Yahya, should, do you want to add one more question or I think it's enough? Okay, uh, apologies to everyone. So to Gus Yahya, please wel welcome Gus Yahya back on stage. Thank you. Yeah, for the first question, uh, we know we are still in a big concerns of having of the potential of the potentiality of having the similar problems that we had before, which is the uh, political weaponization of Islam. Well, actually, NU itself did it did it in the past. You know, I have to admit. Even in 2019, actually, NU did weaponize the NU identity to gather political support for, you know, presidential election. But now we come to a conclusion that this is not right, and this is very, very dangerous. 
is very dangerous. That's why now, first, we have to deal with our own people, right? We call our own people, the NO people, to drop the political, you know, the identity politics. There should be no identity politics, no politics on behalf of any identity, not Islam, not even Nahdlat Ulama. You know. That's why I said uh, repeatedly that there will be no, you know, candidates in the name of Nahdlat Ulama or on behalf of Nahdlat Ulama. No. Each candidate represents his or her own credibility capacity and tech records and not Nahdlatul Lama. That's what I said. Yeah. And I say it repeatedly because yeah. in almost every um, every uh, occasion where Nahdlatul Lama people uh, gather, you know, I say this uh, to them because uh, and I actually uh, move our Nadatulama cadres, you know, to uh, do the campaign, you know, on this uh, idea of not uh, weaponizing Nadatulama or Islam yeah, for political purposes. Now, but we know that this, this is not enough. We need to work more. And the first thing that I believe has to be done is to avoid a dangerous game design for the election. Because everything is about game design. What game do you want to play? Do you want to play football or chess? You know. Do you want to play uh, you know, gladiator <laughs> game? Let's have an, uh, 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 you know, a safe game for the election. Meaning, let us design you know, a safe game for the election. You know. And one among uh, things that we need to do in uh, designing a safe game is to avoid problematic and dangerous candidates. That's the thing. Any candidate that has track record or potentiality uh, or potential uh, you know uh, potential gesture to weaponize identity should be dropped because these are source of of the problem you know that means we need to talk to the uh, political elites not to do it so and there are more that we have uh, we need to uh, uh, to struggle you know to uh, try to do i know that uh, this is uh, not going to be easy for us you know it's, it uh, will take uh, courage and uh, persistence. So this is what we not, we want to do. Now, for a second question, you know, the Madina uh, Charter was uh, well something that is something historic that uh, people should uh, refer to again and. Uh, while addressing our current uh, situation, you know. Uh, Professor Dr. Kureshihab says that actually the idea of nation state was already there, you know, put by the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam himself in the, the Madinah Charter. Madinah Charter actually basically was an idea of a nation state and and this this might be true i i personally believe in it 
live in that. The Madira chapter. The thing is that, you know, in reality, the Madina Charter works for only so, you know, so short of time. After that, people just uh, had no choice but to go to conflicts and wars against each other. And for more than 13 centuries, or 14 centuries, even more than 14 centuries, you know, the Islamic uh, community globally uh, has been uh, growing with this mindset of conflict. We have a huge corpus of discourse in Sharia which uh, offer these ideas of conflicts and enmity against others. That's why we have this idea of Kafir Dimmi in Harbi, for example. Who is Kafir Dimmi? Kafir Dimmi is a second, you know, citizen in any uh, Muslim society. It's just what it is. And this kind of discourse have been, we, we've been living, the Muslim community globally has been, we have been living with this kind of discourse and mindset for more than 14 centuries. But the thing is that, I think this also then related to the, uh, the last question. We have to see the reality. Do we want to continue? this direction of conflict, to want to insist to apply this, you know, this uh, teachings of enmity and conflicts against other, which is established in Sharia discourse. Do we want that? See, the thing is, uh, in reality, uh, a uh, conflict, you know, a call, you know, a, 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 a global conflict, a universal conflict of, identi of identities uh, would not be affordable anymore. Because nowadays, you know, wherever there is a conflict erupts, the whole global society cannot escape from the consequences. Look at what happened with Russia and Ukraine. We Indonesian, we don't have anything to do with them, you know. We, we, we are not involved in any issue related to Russia and Ukraine and even uh, the NATO and Europe and America. No, it's just not of our business. We're not involved in the uh, fight also. But we cannot escape from the consequences, the economic problems that will come as the consequence of that war. Now, if she, in the past, when Islam was uh, represented by Turkey, the, the Ottoman Turks, you know, when there was conflict between Islam and Christianity, it was conflicts between the Ottoman state against the European states, right? And the people who were involved in the fight was professional soldiers of the Ottoman states against professional soldiers of the European states. But now, you see, Muslims live side by side, everywhere in the world, as neighbors with others. You have Muslims in Latin America. In Europe, it's a new phenomenon that Muslims are allowed to live in Europe. It's not before 1970s. Look at the 
dai strici it started only after 1970s that muslims can live and immigrate in uh, you know huge numbers and now become significant uh, demographically significant in european um, society now if we allow conflict of Islam against Christianity is not going to be a war between states. It's going to be a social, you know, disaster. Because it's going to be, you know, neighbors against neighbors, against neighbors. And the result is no other than the, uh, uh, you know, the breakdown of the whole social order. And if we go on with this kind of conflicts to a global stage, then the result will be the destruction of the whole human civilization. So it's not affordable anymore. It is not affordable for us to insist to keep, uh, you know, implying this. 14th centuries established teachings in our Sharia discourse. We have to generate an alternative discourse. And this comes to this, uh, you know, problem with students at universities, you know. See, maybe, uh, you know, the professor, the professor uh, does not... Uh, want to mention but i will mention you know it is the tarbiyah students the uh she supporters of pks and you know actually there are the um uh, the uh supporter of of the ideology of a fellow muslim or muslim brotherhood which is now become maybe the the only survival of this war against <laughs> radicalism and terrorism now yeah, because they operate in a uh, more political way rather than a of uh, you know a violent way see but the idea is to consolidate the islamic world against the non-islamic world that's the, the idea the, the the fundamental idea of the ideology of a Frau Muslim woman and this and this you know so called Tarbiyah movement and hijrah use, you know. It's all about separating themselves from the rest of the world. Right? It's all about segregation. You know. Segregation. And then obviously uh when they think the time is right, you know, it's going to be a conflict against whatever that that they see as others. You know. Now, what we need to do with them? Let's expose them with the reality. What do you want? And look at the reality. Is it feasible or not? You know, it is useless to talk about uh, you know this ideology of caliphate based on uh, textual references it's just it will be no end of discussion but let's bring them to discussion about reality if you want a caliphate a universal caliphate right you have to dissolve indonesia you have to dissolve malaysia you have to dissolve saudi arabia and so forth you know how long you would want to wage war for this and how many how billion people you know how many billion people you want to kill for that idea it's just reality so let's talk to them about reality it's not about NU against non NU <laughs> it's about rational accounts over reality we have to think realistically about what is feasible and what is not.
Thank you. Thank you, J.I.G. Yahya Khalil for your response to all the questions from the audience. Before we close this public lecture, we would like to invite Professor Komarudin to give a plaque to His Excellency Gus Yahya as a token of appreciation. To Professor, please come on stage. And Gus Yahya, please. Uh, let me uh, give a comment uh, shortly. Well, uh, I would like to express my grateful for you, Gus Yahya. It is indeed a very enlightening speech. And then, as I said before, that uh, it is small in one aspect of the explanation of uh, moderate Islam in Indonesia. And it is also one of the answer why Indonesia is the largest Muslim country, but the state is a republic. It is not ethnical state, it is not religious state, but it is civic nation based on citizenship. So this speech explained a lot. And this campus is a window for you, for the student, to look through this window about the reality of the Islamic development in Indonesia. So you should learn not only limited in the classroom, but you should conduct a research to me to discuss to many uh, religious leaders like Kusahya and other leaders in Indonesia because they are the actor, they are the historical maker how to develop further Islam in Indonesia based on the uh, citizenship and humanity as it is written back to the story of, uh, well, Piagam Madinah, Madinah Charter. You know that uh, we have five principles it is the ideology of Indonesia. It is really in line of the Madinah Charter. And this speech, one of the very ex great and clear explanation about why Indonesia established a republic instead of Islamic State. Thank you again, because you are here. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now reached the end of our agenda. Once again, our sincerest gratitude for your participation, whether it is online or offline. Thank you, and we look forward to having you again in another occasion. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.